In the last video, we went through the process of removing the steering rack in this 2011 Dodge Durango. The original steering rack, this one on the floor in front of us, had developed a leak from one of its end seals. We were able to separate the boot on the side with the bad seal just by pulling it off without removing the clamp. I was a bit surprised that this wasn't just full of power steering fluid since the car didn't seem to drip a lot onto the ground, yet it had lost probably half a quart. But whatever the case was, the steering rack did appear to be in need of replacement. Up top is the part number from the steering rack that we removed from the vehicle, and down below is the part number for the remanufactured steering rack that we will be installing. As mentioned previously, this remanufactured unit was only listed as fitting a Jeep Grand Cherokee, but since it's the same chassis, I was hoping that they would interchange. As far as I could tell, externally, the two units are pretty much identical. It sure appeared that we would be able to reinstall this into the Durango and be done with it. Unfortunately, and this is on me for removing the old part before getting a good enough look at this one, but there had been some damage to this remanufactured steering rack in shipping. When I received it, one of the inner tie rod ends was poking through the cardboard box, but I didn't really look at it farther than that. The clamp for the passenger side boot had been damaged and come loose, though the boot itself hadn't been damaged, so it looked like if we just installed a new clamp that we would be okay. But then I saw the more concerning damage. Here on the old steering rack is what this transfer line is supposed to look like. Clearly, its replacement is not looking quite as good. The line is a bit smashed and bent out of shape. This line isn't so bad that it couldn't be bent back, but the other end of that transfer line is actually dented. It is smashed in enough that I wouldn't feel comfortable using this in a power steering system. So we'll also be swapping the lines from the old power steering rack onto the new one. Before we start undoing the lines, we'll get the steering rack boot clamped back on. I tried to just reuse the damaged clamp, but I couldn't get it on there quite as tightly as I would like. A worm gear hose clamp should work just fine in this situation, but the boot material was actually kind of thin and I was worried about piercing it with the sharp edges of a cheap clamp, so we'll use a good old fashioned zip tie. This is a large tie, and since it's so sturdy, we're able to get it pretty tight. It's holding that boot on much better than the reused clamp would have. We'll cut off the excess and call it good enough. In the past, I've used smaller zip ties on these steering rack boots and these large ones on CV axles. Theoretically, they wouldn't last as long as a stainless steel clamp, but I haven't had one fail yet either. Moving on, we've got a crowfoot wrench socket and we'll use it to loosen up the flare nuts on the old power steering rack. And we can remove the small hex bolt that holds the line clamp in place. With that off, we can unscrew the flare nuts the rest of the way and pull the transfer line totally off of the rack. Simply because the old one was looking a bit corroded, I decided we'd transfer the new check valve onto the old line. So we'll also crack loose those flare nuts and separate the valve assembly from the lines. Then we'll repeat that process to remove the dented up line from the remanufactured steering rack, remove its inline valve assembly, making 100% sure that we know the orientation of it, blow out and tidy up the lines we'll be using with some carb cleaner, make sure the lines all have good o-ring seals, and thread the new valve assembly onto the old lines. Then we can thread it back together on the remanufactured steering rack, reinstall and tighten back down the line clamp, and we'll use a crowfoot wrench to get all of those fittings nice and tight. With it all back together, there's one final little touch I'd like to make. The lines on the remanufactured steering rack that we hadn't removed had some of their coating rubbed off. I don't think this happened during shipping, I think it came this way out of the factory. So for an extra personal touch of rust protection, we'll spray some paint on there. I had installed these plugs on the old rack to keep fluid from leaking out while removing it, so we'll transfer them back to the replacement steering rack to help us keep debris out of there as we install it. With all of that done, our remanufactured steering rack is finally ready to go in the car. And to do that, we'll angle it back in the same way it came out. We'll lift it up and feed it through the passenger side subframe opening, pull it far enough through to get the driver's side lifted up, then we can rotate it and slide it back towards the driver's side where it needs to be. Then all we have to do is lift it up and align it to the bolt hole and the first bolt is in. We'll thread on a nut and then install the second mount bolt and its nut. Just like they were when removing it, these are a bit tricky to get to, but there was enough room for me to reach up through the splash guard and hold the nut with an adjustable wrench. 
We'll snug down both bolts into their lock nuts with the impact gun and torque each of the bolts to 180 foot-pounds. Doing this on the floor is not super easy and I had to brace myself pretty solidly against the underside of the engine cradle to make it happen. With the rack mounted back to the vehicle, now we have to reconnect the fluid lines. We'll remove the plugs from the rack and the caps from the hard line and making sure that the o-ring is still in place on the hard line, we'll thread the flare nut back into the steering rack. Then we can tighten those down. There's not a lot of room, so we'll be tightening these by feel. The torque spec for these fittings is 21 foot-pounds, so we'll make sure to give a good push on the wrench to get them nice and tight. And with the top line good to go, we'll repeat that same process to install and tighten the bottom fitting. Now that the system is closed, we'll wipe off as much of the power steering fluid as we can get to. Next on the list is reconnecting the intermediate steering shaft. It had come apart nice and easy, so I wanted to add some anti-seize so that in the unfortunate event it had to be separated again, it wouldn't be difficult. At this point, it's important to make sure that the steering rack is centered left to right. Everything looks good, so we'll line up the flats on each side and slide the intermediate steering shaft coupler back onto the input shaft of the steering rack. Then we'll apply some medium strength thread locker and reinstall the pinch bolt. To make it easier to get a wrench on the bolt, we'll now remove our ratchet strap from the steering wheel and tilt it a little bit to the side. That will get snugged down and then torqued to 33 foot-pounds. Next, we'll be reinstalling the outer tie rod ends. Since this is a different part, there's no guarantee that things will line up exactly right, but we'll give the outer tie rod end 18 turns back onto the steering rack just like how it came off. Each outer tie rod end had just a dab of anti-seize applied. For now, we'll tighten down the jam nut just hand tight since we'll have to check the alignment and almost definitely adjust it later. And we'll repeat that same process on the other side, threading the tie rod end back on 23 turns. We'll leave it hand tight for now and get ready to reinstall the differential. Just an interesting note, this model has a 3.45 to 1 gear ratio, but a few years later they would only put these in the V6 cars and the V8s were stuck with a 3.09. Though when it's paired with an 8-speed transmission, I suppose they have a lot of options for making up for that. If this was a higher mileage car, now would be a good time to replace the output shaft seals on the differential, but they both look to be in perfect shape, so I decided not to mess with them. I did, however, want to clean up some of the rust on the drive shaft flange. We'll give it a light cleaning with just some red Scotch-Brite and WD-40, and once it's back to bare metal, we'll give the whole outside edge a coating of anti-seize. Hopefully, nobody else will have any issues removing that drive shaft. Now that it's ready to go back in, we'll manhandle it back up onto the transmission jack, spend five minutes trying to get it in from every possible angle, push the jack out of the way, and just bench press it up into the subframe. Because of the mount locations and the angle it has to be at to be installed, this was the easiest way. Easiest, but still not terribly easy. Once the rear is about lined up, we'll slide the transmission jack back underneath and use that to hold the differential in place. While it still has some wiggle room, we need to reinsert the CV axles. But of course, I found a way to make the job even more complicated. While giving the output seal one final cleaning, I managed to knock out the spring that holds the lips of the seal tight. Anyone that's ever done this before knows that it can be a huge pain to get reinstalled. The spring needs to be put back on the inside edge of the seal, pressed in against the back of the lip, and pushed in all the way around. Of course, all the spring wants to do is pop back out of place. Sometimes, o-ring picks and flathead screwdrivers can help with this, but in this case I found it easiest just to do by hand. Still, it took me 10 minutes of cursing to reinstall that spring. And once I was finally 100% sure it was back in place and the seal was oiled, We'll make sure the CV axle inner joint is clean and that the slinger disc is still installed on it and get it slotted into the differential. We'll have to wait until the differential is actually bolted in place to get it clicked in. Of course, we need to repeat that same process on the other side with the CV axle that has that extra long inner end. We'll clean up the seal with an extremely light touch and the inner end of that CV axle. We'll slide back on that seal protector slinger disc and push the axle as far as we can get it into the differential. With those tricky steps finally taken, we can now bolt the differential back into the engine cradle. Once all three mounting bolts are reinstalled, we can lower down the jack. 
We'll snug the mounting bolts down and then torque them each to 100 foot-pounds. Well, the service manual would have you torque all three to 100, but the passenger side ones seem too small for that. That bolt's the same size as the ones used to hold on the vibration dampener, so I decided to tighten it down to its torque spec of 45 foot-pounds. I didn't check to be totally sure, but the bolt has a 16mm head, which usually would indicate that it's an M10 by 1.5. Even with a grade 12.9 nut, that means the torque should be somewhere in the realm of 60 foot-pounds. 100 is far too much, and while it might not break or strip the bolt, I wouldn't want to give it the chance. Anyway, with all three differential mounting bolts tightened to a torque spec, it is solidly in place and will keep on moving. Next, we'll reinstall that vibration dampening lump of iron and torque its two mounting bolts down to 45 foot-pounds. And we'll pop that tiny differential breather vent back onto the barb fitting. We'll also go back to the CV axles and click them fully back into the differential. We were able to do this with just a solid shove. With those back in place, things are really coming along. The rest of the reassembly is straightforward. We applied some general use grease to the CV axle splines and popped it back into the hub. Next, we'll reinstall the upper ball joint, although it was going to require a little bit more force than I was able to exert. We'll use a ratchet strap to help pull down the upper control arm until the stud is far enough through the knuckle that we can reinstall the nut. The impact gun will finish pulling it in, and we'll torque down the lock nut to 70 foot-pounds. We'll also pop back in the sway bar end link that we didn't actually have to remove, snug it down, and torque it to 90 foot-pounds. Then we'll slot the outer tie rod end back into the steering knuckle, tighten it down, and torque it to 70 foot-pounds. Then we'll pop the inner brake pad back into place on the caliper, set the outer against the rotor, which we have previously cleaned with brake clean, and give the caliper some extra persuasion to get it fully installed. Then we'll use that close enough but not quite the right sized socket to reinstall the two greased slide pins, and once the socket has been firmly installed into each slide pin, we'll torque them down to 41 foot-pounds. Getting the socket back out required the use of vice grips and a hammer, but without an 11mm hex key socket, the 7 16ths will do in a pinch. Finally, the caliper spring clip gets reinstalled, and that's the passenger side back together, which was the one that was taken much farther apart, so there's not as much to do on the driver side. All we really have to do is reinstall and torque the upper ball joint and the outer tie rod end to the steering knuckle. We'll also use the impact gun to whiz back on both of the CV axle nuts. These are lock nuts, and it would be ideal to replace them, but they were still a nice tight fit on the threads, so I think we'll be just fine. In order to torque the axle nuts to 229 foot-pounds, I had a helper stand on the brake pedal to hold everything still. With that, we're very nearly done, and the last thing that has to be reinstalled is the front drive shaft. There was a lot of gooey thread locking compounds still on the bolts, so we clamped them in the vise in pairs and used a thread chaser to clean them up. Pretty soon, they were cleaned up and ready to reinstall. We'll roll back under the car and push the drive shaft into the differential flange. We'll line back up the marks we made so that it went back on the same way it came off, although I really don't feel like it would matter all that much. With blue Loctite on each of the bolts, we'll reinstall them and snug them all down. Once they were all in, we took a look all the way around to make sure that the drive shaft was fully installed into the flange. Now we'll go around and torque all of these to spec, which is 24 foot-pounds. That seems a bit light for the size of the bolts, which is why you really need some thread locker on there. Our helper held down on the brakes while I tightened the bolts two at a time. So everything is reattached, but we still need to refill the front differential. We used one of these large fluid transfer syringes to fill it back up. After a few of those, the differential was full and we can tighten the fill plug back down. We'll finish by torquing that to 26 foot-pounds. Now that most of the vehicle is back together, it's time to refill the power steering fluid. The owner's manual calls for ATF plus 4, which is exactly what we'll be adding. Before starting this job, the fluid level was at the minimum line on the reservoir, and now it's dropped about an inch and a half. We'll fill it up to just a little bit above the maximum line, and start the engine up. The power steering pump pulled in a lot of that fluid in just five seconds, so we shut the engine back off to refill the reservoir. 
With it back just above the maximum line, we'll start the engine back up and start bleeding the system. Basically, with the front of the vehicle still off the ground, we'll turn the steering all the way from one lock to the other. The system gulped down a little bit more fluid, so I kept topping off the reservoir. We repeated this process for about 5 minutes until there were no more bubbles coming into the power steering reservoir and there was no groaning coming from the power steering system. That means all of the air is out of the power steering pump, the lines, and the power steering rack. It's also a good time to check for leaks, and fortunately there didn't appear to be any. Which meant it was time to complete the reassembly by installing the skid plate. Something I didn't realize when I removed it was that the front two bolt holes in the skid plate were slotted so those bolts can stay in and help support it while removing and installing it. So we'll slide it onto those and then thread in the two rear bolts. All of those will get snugged down and then tightened down. The torque spec for these is 21 foot-pounds. I only actually found that out after doing the job, but it's not exactly a critical specification. Next, we'll reinstall both front wheels and snug down all of their lug nuts. With the wheels back on, even with the vehicle still off of the ground, we can clearly see that there's a tremendous amount of toe in. The vehicle's not even really drivable like this, so we'll have to give it a good old-fashioned tape measure alignment. We'll lift it up off of the jack stands and set the vehicle down on wooden boards so that we have a little bit more room to work underneath. Now that everything is held still, we'll take the opportunity to torque down all of the lug nuts to 110 foot-pounds. We've covered the process of performing a tape measure alignment quite a few times on other vehicles, and the process is no different here. A measurement is taken between a fixed spot in the tread at the front of the tires, and then again at the rear. In this case, the measurement at the front was 65 and a half, and at the rear was 64 and a half. That means that the front has an entire inch of overall toe in. That is quite bad, and we will have to adjust it. We can't exactly compare that to the service manual since it only lists a specification in degrees, but it says the preferred setting is 0.20 degrees of toe in. I'm pretty sure that's going to be less than one inch. To change that, we need to extend the outer tie rod ends. This was a bit annoying because those steering rack boots just wanted to bunch up as the inner tie rod end was spun. To prevent issues, we simply removed the constant tension clamp and spun the boot around by hand about every half of a turn. We tried to make the same amount of adjustment for the left and right side tie rod ends, but who knows if any of this is centered. After repeating this process a few times, we managed to get a reading of 65 and 3 8 inches in the front and 65 and 7 16 in the rear meaning the total reading was a sixteenth of an inch toe in, which is pretty much what I assumed the factory specification would be in inches. Happy with that measurement, we got the jam nuts nice and tight and reinstalled the boot clamps. Depending on which part of the service manual you believe, the torque spec for those jam nuts is between 55 and 69 foot-pounds. And with that at least good enough to drive, we are finally, finally, finally done with this job. I took the car out for a test drive and everything performed well. The steering wheel center wasn't perfect, but it was relatively close. With another adjustment or two we could have sorted this out, but the vehicle was going to get an alignment pretty soon anyway, so we figured it would be fine until then. In fact, jumping ahead a week, here's the report from the professional alignment that was performed on the vehicle. As mentioned, the steering center isn't perfect, but it's less than a quarter of a degree off. After that first drive, the vehicle did dump a little bit of fluid on the ground, but I think it was just sitting on top of the subframe and kind of pooled on the skid plate. It doesn't seem to have leaked a drop in the months since then, and the level in the reservoir never changed. All that work for one lousy little seal. But I am pretty happy that we figured out a much more DIY friendly solution than the procedure in the factory service manual. Hopefully, these videos go to show that it is still possible to do some work on modern vehicles on your own and save a fair amount of money.